So it's my pleasure to kick off today's program by highlighting a report Sim released last week called Best Practices in Combining Smart TV and Set-Top Box Data. Sim completed this study with Howard Schimmel of JANA Strategy and Insights and Gerard Broussard of Premeditated Media. So Howard will provide a short summary of key findings and then Gerard will moderate a panel to discuss best practices among some of the companies who are commingling these data sets now. So welcome, Howard. Thank you, Jane. Um, and I hope everybody is managing through these insanely crazy times. Um, hopefully we'll be able to see each other live in person sometime soon. Obviously that's a key thing we all love about being in this industry. I'm happy to share a brief summary of the research that Gerard and I conducted to create best practices for creating an integrated set-top box and smart TV ACR data set. Our research was done in two phases. The first phase was conducting interviews with the actual data owners, the providers of set-top box and the providers of smart TV ACR data sets. We wanted to better understand their data processing and data management rules. The second phase was actually interviewing companies who are in the business now of co-mingling or integrating smart TV ACR and smart TV uh, and set-top box data sets. We want to understand their methods for doing the integration and Gerard and I used what we learned in those interviews as well as our, our industry expertise and insights to create the recommendations that we're going to share with you. On the next slide, you'll see the list of companies that we represent that we interviewed. We interviewed 18 total different companies. Um, we'd like to extend our thanks and gratitude to everybody. Um, you were all very gracious with your time. You were open and transparent in answering our questions. And obviously, we couldn't have done this project without your cooperation. So again, thank you very much. The next slide provides an evaluation side by side of the complementary nature of set-top box and smart TV ACR data sets. The reality is that these data sets are very complementary. They each have strengths and weaknesses, and they actually, the strengths of one actually offset in many instances the weaknesses of others. The strengths of set-top box data include being able to measure multiple sets in the home, being able to capture and resolve time-shifted viewing whether it's time shifted on a DVR or on a video on demand services, service. The, smart, the strengths of smart TV ACR data include being able to be certain about when a frame of content actually hits a TV screen. Those data sets tend to be more national in nature. And they also were able to provide importantly, some line of sight to connected TV viewership. On the next slide, we wanted to try to better understand the potential coverage of both of these data sets. The good news is that these data sets cover nearly 90% of the US linear TV population. There are only 12% of homes that either don't have cable, so they're not in a smart TV, um, in a set-top box data set, or they don't have an enabled smart TV, so they're not in an ACR data set. So the issue that we face is not, not one of national representation, but it's really about how many of the different owners of these data sets would be willing to make their data available to the market for use in a large scale national um, integrated data set. The next slide evaluates the demographic composition of these data sets. It's really important to acknowledge that these data sets have very unique and complementary data skill, data skews. Set-top box data skews a bit old. It's fairly balanced for, for race and ethnicity, and it skews a bit upscale. Smart TV data sets tend to be a bit younger. They skew towards Hispanic homes, and they're upscale. One of our recommendations is a need to segregate these data, especially the smart TV ACR data sets, into segments potentially cable, over the air, and broadband only, and to do that segre segregation prior to applying weights. The ARF's upcoming universe estimate study 
should provide accurate market estimates to guide that weighting exercise. One concern we've heard is whether it's possible for the model to be able to represent segments that are not represented in the underlying data set, that 12% I mentioned a few, a few minutes ago. It, ha it turns out that that 12% tends to be heavily Hispanic and heavily skewed towards African-American homes. We believe that by putting together an overlap panel, homes that have both ACR and smart TV together could allow us to compensate for and adjust for this 12% and its unique data skills, uh, skews. Um, next slide, please. Another issue we address is the need for there to be open transparency into the data batching process. Um, on your own, each of these data sets have somewhat limited utility. They need to be matched to a demographic provider, a provider of basic household information like Experian um, for, for weighting and balancing. They need to be weighted to other databases like a location provider to be able to use, be used in targeting and in measurement. And you can see as you go from left to right that sample is lost throughout the matching process. And there is greater sample loss dealing with smart TV ACR data because the issue is it needs to be resolved on an IP address basis where set-top box is generally able to be resolved on a customer mailing address basis. Our, our recommendation is that the matching process should be open and transparent. So the next slide lays out the recommendation that Gerard and I um, created. And, and is, um, this is detailed in, in great depth in the reports that are available to everyone. We came up with five stages and I'm gonna spend a lot of time on stage four. Um, stage one is go ahead and select the data sets. You know, obviously that exercise needs to be somewhat um, driven by what your end goal is in terms of creating an integrated data set? Is it currency? Is it data-driven linear planning? Is it cross-platform planning? Um, obviously, having multiple providers is better than having a single provider within Setup Box or within ACR. The second stage includes establishing the matching and co-mingling design. Here again, we go into the, the idea of wanting to be very specific about using an overlap panel and also being able to think about the segments that you want to make sure that you're able to properly represent in the integrated data set, especially thinking about the unique differences in cable homes versus over the air homes versus broadband only homes. Stage three involves actually executing the match and as I said before, being able to do a very good job of making sure that the matching process does not create any bias in the underlying viewing of the homes that survive the matching process. Stage four is to go through a very important stage of calibrating and weighting. One benefit of creating an integrated ACR set-top box data set is the ability to actually have a group of homes where you're getting both measured from those same homes, which allow you to do calibration, both calibrating ACR data based on what you learned from the overlap in terms of the, from set-top box and, the, and the, the reverse. Once you do the calibration, then you're able to go through a process of weighting, potentially by individual universe, scaling, and then combining those data sets into one consolidated national large scale data set that could be used in reporting and analysis. Then finally, stage five is a process of validation. The next slide lays out what I talked about, about the benefits of having an overlap panel. The reality is that by combining set-top box data and smart TV data and resolving it at a household level, you will have some scale of panelists where you both have the ability to see what ACR reports for those homes, as well as what set-top box reports for those homes. That overlap can be used to both calibrate for some of the shortcomings in ACR homes, for, for example, being able to model for 
ACR tending to only represent one home, 1.1 set per home. It can be used to model the MVPD specific universe. We've known for a long time dealing with MVPD set top box data that there's an issue with set on, set off, capping long viewing sessions. So the overlap panel serves as an important data set to be able to combine how you take each of the individual data sets, account for some of their limitations, and then use those integrated data sets to build your combined data. The full presentation, which is about 60 slides, and the white paper are available on the SIM website now. Gerard and I are also available to speak with anyone who wants to dig into this important topic in more depth. In more depth. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Gerard of Premeditated Media and his expert panel who will discuss these findings in greater detail. Thank you. Howard, uh, thank you for passing the baton and your, my partner in crime on this uh, very intricate project that we just executed. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that everyone that, that's on this panel here has, was involved in the project. And I want to echo Howard's thanks to them um, you know, in getting everything started here and, and finishing up with us. It, it, it went a lot longer than we had anticipated with all the digging that we did in the process of discovery for uh, putting all the uh, best practices together. Um, and so uh, now we're just ready to, I guess, uh, pop the champagne here and talk a little bit about it. So. Uh, what I'd like to do is, um, if we could, um, I, you can see everybody's name here in company, but one by one, if it, we start with David, if you could just give your, you know, tell you who you are and what you do at Comscore, that would be great. We'll go on down to Josh, Carolyn, and Tom. Sure. Thanks, Gerard. I'm David Algranati, and I'm the Chief Product Officer at Comscore. Hi, my name is Josh Chasen, and I am the Chief Measurability Officer at VideoM. I'm Caroline Horner, uh, head of product at 605. I'm Tom. I'm uh, there's too many chiefs and not enough Indians on this panel. I'm the chief data scientist at Marketcast. I know that the introductions seem formal because it seems like we're all family here, but uh, just let's mark that off and, and get right into it. Roll up our sleeves here. So um, the first question I've got for you folks is, uh, you know, we, again, thank you for, for taking part of this. It was very great speaking with, with each one of you uh, during that process of the study. Uh, what are some of the key challenges that are encountered when you're actually uh, it, uh, below the, the engine there, looking at the spark plugs and so on, uh, when you're co-mingling set-top box and ACR data? Um, and I, I would start with Tom on this one and then open it up to everyone else, if I might. I mean, the, the, the biggest difficulty really is the fact that they're created very, very differently. Yeah? And they're actually measuring different things. So I mean, yeah, fundamentally, the set-top box is talking about the implement, what goes into the set-top box data set. Yeah? So that can give us really accurate tuning records, really accurate VOD records. But it doesn't know anything about what the TV is doing. It doesn't know if the TV is switched on what's on the TV, what's going on on different inputs. Yeah. Uh, you know, on the other hand, the smart TV with ACR will know anything in the ACR database that's been shown on the glass, uh, but it won't know exactly wh which, net which network's been tuned into it. We'll have to deduce that. It won't, you know, we'll have to use algorithms to work out if it's video on demand or not. Um, and this makes it really difficult and challenging to make a consistent data set. You know, one of the things you want in a co-mingled panel is, you know, you don't want, you know, your results skewed by the fact that some of your data comes from smart TV and some of it comes from set top box. So for me, you know, one of the first challenges under the hood is making the data sets look comparable, really, so you can get consistent results regardless of, you know, whether that particular home has got, you know, one or two smart TVs or one or two set top boxes in it. Other members here? Sure. Oh, sorry, Josh, go ahead. No, please, David, please. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with um, the points that Tom has made. So there's a couple of dynamics here, like, uh, and one thing to think about is neither of these data sources um, maybe have been engineered the same way meter data would be engineered. So, so they are, they can be used for measurement purposes, but let's say, um, uh, not 
But typically when there's metered technology, that meter is designed specifically for measurement. Here, these data are maybe um, artifacts of other reporting capabilities, and then they need to be uh, made suitable for measurement. And then uh, the properties of set-top box data and using those for measurement have been explored longer than the properties of ACR data. And, and that isn't to say that one is better or worse than the other. As if one is, maybe there's an existing body of work that sort of more understands the properties of set-top box data specifically for measurement purposes. Then, and I think the, Tom's point is like, uh, in, in that commingling, having an awareness that, um, uh, I'll say whether you want to call it business rules, data hygiene, edit rules of the two sources uh, need to be separate and then uh, applied separately before then bringing the data together. Yeah, I'm, I'm going uh, to, I'll violently agree with everything Tom and David said. I, I, the way I want to answer this question is I want to loop back to, to, to and amplify Howard's point that uh, each of these data sets are very different and they each have strengths and weaknesses. So I wanna mention for me that like a, a, a significant shortcoming for each data set, right? So for the set-top box data, and I think David and Tom have already hit on this, you've got the issue of what people call phantom tuning and what I call a box on set off. That sounds like it's uh, the karate kid view of audience measurement, but you know, box on set off. Um, and there is a lot of tuning that you see uh, that happens when the box is on and the sets off. So that's a thing you have to contend with on the set-top box side. On the smart TV side, and I want to say in front of this industry pundit audience, I like to call it smart TV data and not ACR data, because we know that ACR has other uses in measurement besides just being deployed by smart TV manufacturers. So I like to call it smart TV data. The smart TV data, the, the lovely thing about cable data is that it comes in households. So you, I always think about a household that has maybe Cox a cable, they've got three sets and they've got uh, three Cox boxes, but they've got a Vizio set and an LG set and a Samsung set. So with the cable data, you can treat it as households of data. Now there are obviously exceptions, but the exceptions are, you know, like, like one box doesn't return data or, or one set isn't on cable, but, but, but those are manageable exceptions that you can adjust for. Um, but the challenge becomes, how do you take your uh, partial coverage data set of smart TVs and turn that into households before you integrate. The reason I wanted to mention these two issues is because both of them can be, I believe, addressed when you've got that overlap data set, right? So if you can find households in both your smart TV footprint and your uh, set top box footprint, you can start to understand when is the box on and the set off because you can find matching pairs and you can start understand what a household of tuning looks like when you have the smart TV set. Yeah, and I would, you know, first of all, I've, uh, the folks on this call have had a deep experience. Uh, so it's wonderful to let that ride and say exactly what they said. Um, the point that I would uh, like to drill in on is uh, something that Tom had mentioned is that um, the absolute belief that what was on screen was identified correctly. And what um, the information that we've learned from working with both data sets and one that Josh points out with the overlap, you know, we have two devices with two different meterings for the exact same behaviors. And, that, and from that, we also see that the algorithms that identified what content was on screen sometimes need correcting. And so, you know, there's definitely um, more there there to dig into. Um, and as David so rightly pointed out, you know, we've been working with set-top box data for a long time and the ACR is young and it's evolving and it has a lot of promise. But when you put both of them together, that's where you can unlock the value of both data sets. So I mean, I, I guess I would see myself as slightly more ACR native. I mean, I guess I've been, you know, I've been I, again, I've been working with set-top box data longer than uh, ACR data, but obviously I was involved in developing some ACR data. So there's a little bit of bias. I mean, I'd I'd love to know which data set you found that the false positives on. The uh, we had a we had a, we had a project that we did around ad detection. Yeah, mm -hmm. 
where we were seeing very different commercials being detected from ACR data sets than what we were seeing in the outer analog from other data sets. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we recorded uh, footage, we recorded 24 hours of about five different networks. Mm -hmm. And we went, we had someone go through, tag exactly which ad was seen. We compared it with exactly what we were seeing in ad logs from different places. And the funny thing is the ACR data got it right every single time. Yeah. And quite often the ACR data was different. And I think you know, with ACR, sometimes, you know, it might, it's not going to say it was this airing. Yeah, it's not going to go down to the telecast level. Yeah, but certainly on the ACR, you can go. You know, you can go to the bank with was it on the screen? Yeah. Uh, was so, something was that content identified on the screen? Yes. Yeah. Um, was it attributed to the right network? Was it attributed to the right location? You know, there are some that's other. That's absolutely right. Yeah. So what I what I see here right now is that we're getting the complementary nature of both sources. It's a very good debate that's taking place here. Um, and that you can't really have one without the other, I believe. And I'm not sure if there's one that's going to be dominant, certainly, uh, as we, uh, my own pontification here. But uh, as the year, years go by, there's going to be a lot of set top box that have to, uh, you know, meet their investments for the MVPD. So it's going to be a two measurement world for the for years to come, I think. Uh, so, I think, yeah. So I was also going to say, I think. The use cases and the timing are different as well, though. Yeah. So again, there are some use cases that I can only use set-top box data for. Yeah. And there are some I can only use smart TV data. You know, if I'm looking at matching identity, you know, yes, you can get quickly generally have more matching rights with ACR data, less with set-top box. So I think there's biz there are business issues as well around yeah. this. I, I thought since we're talking about co mingling the two, that we would uh, stick to, I guess, the use cases where the co mingling is necessary. Uh, that's my job as the moderator <laughs> to do that. Uh, but what I got from you guys and, and other companies was, and it doesn't sound too elegant, that the process is sort of like putting lipstick on a pig in many cases. It doesn't sound too elegant, but uh, after you, you come out with something very beautiful uh, in the end. Uh, yeah, you get one hell of a pig when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, uh, so Howard and I um, had the good fortune to listen to a lot of different input from you folks. And what we found, I, I think, was a lot of commonality, actually, uh, which leads me to my next question or, or the topic of discussion is the, is the uh, notion of standardization. What do you think the prospects are at this early stage when combining these two data sets for some sort of process standardization? Uh, or even reporting standardization. I'll, I'll open it up to anyone who wants to answer first. I'm okay. happy. Oh, oh go, go Karen. No, please, Caroline, after you. All right, Karen. Um, you know, certainly um, there's a hope for standardization. Um, you know, receiving data from providers um, would certainly would love to write um, simpler ETLs on them. Um, you know, how we transform those data sets to look alike, to behave similarly, and to be, um, to associate with each other. Um, but I think that's a very hard thing to expect, um, you know, because each business model that generated, as David aptly put out, pointed out, they, these are byproducts of measurement that were made for other purposes. And so it's unlikely that everybody's business model is going to align so that the actual data that's being generated can be the same. Um, I think about ooh, 10, 15 years ago, um, I was involved with the MRC initiative that tried to do a standardization of set-top box data generation. And that proved to be elusive. Um, and I think the same thing's gonna happen um, with uh, ACR and you know, adding it together. But that doesn't mean there shouldn't be some standardization in what comes out and how we had treated it. And I think you guys um, nicely put a lot of those recommendations and best practices into the paper. Um, we wanna get to interoperability. Um, and so things like the metadata that we all use, the definitions of the, the schedules and even the ads, the ad schedules in both the content and even um, one other, which is the definition of marketplaces um, and the TVUEs, such as the one that uh, ARF is putting forward, um, those standardizations, I think, are critical to interoperability and the adoption of these data sets. Yeah, and one thing I'll, I'll maybe add to Caroline's point, that 
it might not be obvious to the industry or, or those who are, aren't involved in it, but there, there's not standardization across the set-top box data. Uh, so, so aspiring, it's a good aspiration to have standardization across set-top box data and ACR data, but like uh, some of the, right now I'll say that's not an industry initiative that's currently, let, let's say like, the companies represented on this panel are imposing some standardization in our own processes and services that we're delivering to the marketplace. But there's not, um, but even it, whether you want it to look just within ACR or just within set-top box, there's neither standardization in either of those supplies today. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of Ralph Waldo Emerson who said a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that too much standardization is a good idea at this point. I know, I know I'm, I'm echoing what David and Caroline said. There was that glorious moment in time uh, in the middle of the last decade when the three of us worked together. So uh, that may be why we agree on a lot, yeah. Um, Great mind. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I tend to think that this is a science and I'm specifically talking about the integration of, of these two types of data. Um, that is too early in, in, the, in its evolution for uh, imposition of too much standardization. I know people hate hearing that. Uh, I know there's a generally a sense in our industry of, you know, hey, there's multiple vendors. If they all just did this stuff the same, the data would match and that would be awesome. Uh, but that really hasn't been in the case when we've tried to do standardization of different methodologies before. And I tend to think that we're better served if we allow more innovation to take place amongst companies like ours, the, us on the panel, uh, in a competitive context so that we can decide what ultimately constitutes best practices and thus should be standardized. So I feel like we'll get there, but I don't think it's necessarily time yet because I don't think uh, we've played, I don't think we've all taken our best shot yet, quite frankly. Uh, we're, going, we're all gonna innovate, we're all gonna develop things and sometimes standardization is the enemy of innovation. That said, I think some types of standardization will be extremely helpful. And what I mean there is things like metadata and market definitions, for example, that would be helpful, I think, and, and perhaps warranted if, 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 if SIM could help the industry align around stuff like that. I mean, I would, I would echo that. I mean, I would love nothing more than to see, not even, just standard market definitions, just standard spellings of market names and networks. You know, I mean, every time we get a set of ads run logs, I mean, I have literally had data scientists cry, you know, uh, because of just stupid changes in how different providers spell, you know, market names and network names. I don't understand why as an industry beyond us just to use common names for these things, even if they aren't quite the same thing. No, I, so what I'm hearing here is that um, everyone agrees that um, that the road to process could be differentiated across all the companies who all want to get there in it, maybe a, similar or different ways, but that the output would, would be helpful to uh, maybe worship the same metric uh, and have de standard naming conventions and definitions to some degree. Uh, what Harold uh, Howard and I found uh, during the study, uh, some, sometimes the users define uh, exactly how they, uh, what they calculate in terms of, let's say, a rating or an ad exposure. Uh, and that's left up to the brand and sometimes the uh, combination of the agency and the advertiser, how they want to define their own uh, the brand metrics. So uh, we're sort of confounded to standardize at the same time everybody's going, uh, seem, or a lot of companies seem to be going towards a customized view of things. And that, that is exactly what I was going to follow up with Tom, what Tom said was that we can, we can standardize on the definition of metrics. Um, I think that is a possibility. Um, there is a, a lot of interesting uh, uh, dialogue going on with um, second level and the definition of, of average audience and what does that mean as you go to second level versus minute level um, cross platform across, of course. Um, and I, I think that we need to um, get to that negotiated um, center point. Um, but for the interim, as Josh was pointing out, the innovation in measurement, we do not need to always stick to the older processing rules that were popular from the 40,000 panel households, um, 40,000 40, households.
several panels. Um, there are some very intriguing metrics that we can build on the innovation side. And I think um, we need that freedom to do that. And the, the spirit that I want to encourage in the industry is to embrace the evolution. Um, the, the nature is to try and pull it back to the prior definitions. And I think that is something, you know, I want to inspire folks to see the value of these new metric definitions. Yeah, and I, I think just to, maybe just a last word on this before we move on to the next thing is that the tendency is to pull towards those definitions to meet the financial and accounting requirements, um, you know, for record keeping more so than the actual application in the marketplace. Um, so adjusting for biases, that's the next uh, topic of discussion. If you folks could describe how you may be applying weights to adjust for the biases that occur uh, naturally when you're, when you're melding one or, or two more of these types of uh, data sets together and how you, you deal with those, uh, what you do to compensate for them with weights, um, and then uh, how you might compensate for the unmatched records. So you have that little, remember uh, Howard's slide with that little sliver in the middle where there's, where there's the overlap between the set-top box and ACR. Well, what do you do with the other parts of the circle? So, so uh, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Joe, sorry. Uh, I, that's it. If you want to start, David, that's fine. Sure. Uh, I Actually, I want to point, I, I have a clarification point on sort of that Venn diagram that Howard showed. And you know, Caroline had a comment earlier, but I, I want to surface a distinction. The Venn diagram was describing household overlap. When Caroline spoke earlier, she talked about device overlap. Sure. And uh, so there's a difference between, uh, I know this uh, set is in David Algranati's house, and I know this set top box is in David Algranati's house versus I know that this set is tied to this set top box in David Algranati's house. And some of the applications, like if we were interested in uh, gross minutes viewed from David Algranati's house, um, knowing this may overstate that viewership. Knowing this, you could account for it. And then further, if you knew that these were both in there, but they're actually distinct, like, so, like, I have a set-top box measurement here. It's not tied here. Like, that, so the, there's both a household-level component and a device-level component. And some of the features or benefits that are anticipated from having that overlap uh, require having sort of a device-level assessment. Okay. Uh, but then to, uh, so, so then uh, nested in that, is kind of uh, a, an algorithmic approach. Like how, how does one know? Like, how do you make that determination? Like first, like, hey, it's in the same household versus if they're tied together. Uh, and I'll say, you know, there are uh, the signals that come off of these sources are um, typically not the same signal. So, so uh, the common signal today coming off of uh, uh, smart TVs would be, let's say, like an external IP address. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, the signal coming off of uh, set-top boxes would be anchoring back to a subscriber file or, or a name and address. So nested in there is, well, how well can one resolve one to the other if you want to use that? But even if you could, that wouldn't get you to a device level. That would only get you to this is David Algranati's house. Uh, so then uh, there's work, uh, I'll say that, that, that has, we, we've done at Comscore to essentially, uh, I'll say through signal processing, you know, infer like that what's coming off this smart TV is so similar to what's coming off this set-top box mm -hmm. that it's highly improbable that they're not tied together. Like, like, right. And so you could think of that as like changes in channels or like, oh, this is on discovery channel. This is on discovery channel. And then this moves to USA and this moves to USA. That type of behavior yeah. essentially gives enough of a signal pattern to assess similarities. So uh, uh, David, uh, assuming yeah. that you did that with some level of competency, there would still be 
uh, a level of uh, inequality in the skews in the different samples. Yes. So what we're asking here is how we address that. Yeah, so there's a component too. So uh, I understand the question, but I don't think the question could be answered adequately without that premise. Okay. So um, the, and then one, one key aspect of the question though is neither of these are probability samples. So, so the tactics that we are familiar with to deal with probability samples are helpful, but not by themselves sufficient to deal with these skews. So, so for example, um, uh, it, it's understood, let's say if, if you're getting set-top box data and uh, Fox Sports Midwest is not available through this MVPD, then you shouldn't expect to see any viewership of Fox Sports Midwest. And when you make an estimate for Fox Sports Midwest, you ought to account for that, that skew. Uh, so so there's, there's certain tactics that I think can be leveraged, like uh, weighting approaches and, and sample weighting approaches that exist in probability samples that are useful, but they aren't by themselves sufficient. And under, so having a, a non-probability sample or bias samples aren't, uh, doesn't mean that they're useless. They're, I think everyone believes they're useful at this stage, maybe 25 years ago or even less than that, people were uncertain if they were useful. Uh, but I think there's a component of that where- well, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting a signal that I need for the powers that be that we need to conclude here. I, I, sure, I, I, sorry, I, Gerard. No, no, that's all right. You were getting to some, into some very interesting and depth, depth areas here. So. I, I'll, let's call it here. I wanted to ask a final question, but I think I have to wrap it up now. But I, I wanted to thank you very much for uh, participating here. You guys did uh, fantastically. Thank you for all the great insights. Okay? Thank Looking you. Looking forward to the rest thank of the day. Thank you, bye. Thanks so much, you guys, uh, Gerard, Carolyn, Josh, David, and Tom, uh, for those fantastic uh, expert insights. You can all see that this is a lot more complicated, you know, than it may seem on the surface. And uh, so we're glad to have you guys on the case. And and thanks for giving Sim the task to uh, do what we can to help to uh, standardize spelling and metadata. So we'll get to work.